So what's going on guys, DIY Dan here again, and this is another episode of Day to Day Around the House, or Backroads Arizona, whichever you prefer. In this video, I'm actually adding a 220 volt outlet to my garage to run a Lincoln Electric 180 HD welder that I purchased so I could work on my sand cars and for other projects as well. Now, because we are dealing with electricity, I felt I had to be very thorough in my description of things in this video, but I moved through it as fast as possible so I don't waste your time. This video will go through everything from beginning to end, including what supplies I use to do this project, wiring diagrams, and an explanation of how your electrical panel works so you have an understanding of it, how I cut the hole for the outlet box and wired that in, as well as running the wiring from that outlet box to the electrical panel itself. I will also be showing you how to test your electrical panel to make sure it is shut down so it's safe to work on and install your circuit breaker and hook up the wiring inside that panel. So let's get to it. So as far as the supplies needed for this project, I ended up getting a three prong 220 outlet I bought the deepest two gang electrical box in plastic that I can get. The reason I went that deep is because with this large a wire, it's nice to have the extra room. However, I did end up having to get a little shallower one and I'm gonna explain why later in this video. I got a cover for a two gang box for that 220 outlet, along with six foot of eight gauge three conductor wire with a bare ground cable, also known as Romex or NM cable. Now the reason I bought three conductor wire and a bare ground was because I thought for this outlet I was gonna be using two 120 legs and a common. However, after doing a little bit more research, it ended up needing two 120 legs and a ground. Since I had already bought the three insulated wire conductor cable, that's what I ended up using and I just used that white wire for the ground because it was thicker than the bare ground. However, what I could have gone with is a two conductor wire with a bare ground to accomplish what was needed for this project. I went with the Romex cable because of the extra protective layer around it. It does not require any conduit as long as it's running in the walls of a house. And then I went ahead and purchased a 40 amp circuit breaker to power that outlet. So here's a chart with the recommended gauge wire for what size circuit breaker you're using for a max distance of 80 feet. Now being as though I was just using this outlet for a welder and I looked at the cord on the welder and it's only using a 14 gauge wire, I was comfortable in the fact that I was only going six feet to my outlet with that eight gauge wire. But if you're ever in doubt, it's always better to go with a larger wire size because if you end up going with too small of a gauge wire, you could possibly overheat that circuit, which could be a possible fire hazard. So always look at the specification on what you're planning on using off of this outlet. And also, if you're running super long distance away from the electrical panel, you might need to upsize your wire size as well. One other quick side note, guys, is as far as wire sizes go, it is kind of opposite what you would think. The smaller the number, the bigger the wire size is. So my welder is a 14 gauge wire. The eight gauge wire is substantially larger as far as wire size goes than that 14 gauge. So to make things a little easier on me, I decided to hook the wires up to the outlet before putting it in the wall. My thought process behind doing this was so I could get a nice, clean, accurate cut on each length of wire so I did not have a bunch of excessive wire in the outlet box because with this big of wire, that can definitely become a problem. Now when this project was all said and done, there was some positive and negatives to hooking these wires up to the outlet before installing them in the wall. And I'll be explaining those a little bit later in this video. As far as hooking your wires up on the back side of this outlet, you're gonna have two 120 legs and a ground. The ground is gonna be the round pole at the top of the outlet. And then your two different 120 legs will be on the straight poles. As far as which 120 leg goes on which straight pole, it doesn't matter as long as you get the ground in the right position. Now because the Romex wire I had had the three insulated wires, black, red, and white, and then a bare ground, I used the black and the red wires for my 120 legs on the straight poles of the outlet. And because I had one extra wire, either the bare ground or the white wire that I had to cut, I decided to cut the bare ground because the white insulated wire was a heavier gauge wire 
and I used it for my ground. If you're using the two wire Romex with the bare ground, then the bare wire would go on your ground and then the black and white wire would be your two 120 legs. So the first time I added some extra wiring to my house, I cut out a square piece of the drywall behind the electrical box to make it easier to run my wiring. Instead of patching that back in, I took some pieces of baseboard, put it around that piece of drywall, added two extra pieces of one by three behind the wall so I could remove that piece of that drywall anytime I needed it if I wanted to add more wiring. Using my density stud finder, I marked out where the edge of the stud was just to the right of my electrical box. I took my outlet box and I put it just to the right of that line I made from the stud and marked out the outer diameter of the box. I drilled out a couple holes on the corners of that outline and then used my little hand saw to connect the dots. You can also use a razor knife to do this. One thing I will emphasize is you'll notice I cut a little tiny hole out at first and that was so I could feel around with my finger to make sure there was no wiring or anything that I could possibly hit while I was cutting out the hole. I did go pretty small at first and then checked it a couple times until I opened it up enough where I had a nice tight fit with that electrical box. I had to drill a hole through the stud between where I was mounting that electrical box and where the electrical panel was. I used my phone, put the flash on, and took a video in the wall to make sure there was no plumbing or wiring that I would hit while I was drilling the hole through that stud to run my wire through. Once making sure that was clear, I used a one inch spade drill bit to drill that hole through the stud. I used a small piece of quarter inch copper tubing that I had laying around and fed it from where I cut the hole in the drywall for the outlet box down through that stud so I could run my wires in the electrical box. It worked well because I could bend it at an angle and it would stay there while I was trying to find that hole that I drilled through the stud. You could also use some tie wire to accomplish this. Once getting that fed through to the electrical panel area, I tied a piece of rope to the copper pipe and pulled it up back through where I cut my hole for my electrical box. Then tied that rope to my electrical cord using a series of overhand knots. And if you think about that, as you pull it, it just tightens more and more down on the electrical cord. Using some electrical tape, I taped up the end where the cord met the rope so there was no abrupt changes that I would get caught on as I pulled it back through the stud in the wall. So more often than not, I usually have at least one dumb thing I do during each project that I tackle. And I always show you guys the dumb stuff I do. So in this case, since I had hooked up my wires to the outlet to try and make it easier on myself on the table, I needed to run the electrical cord through the outlet box before running it through the wall and I forgot to do that. So right here, I'm disconnecting the three wires off of my outlet so I could run that electrical cord through that outlet box and then reattach the three wires back up to my outlet. When you punch the hole through the outlet box, you only want to break the one side. If you break both sides, the wire is just able to fall in and out of the box with no problem. When you only break the one side, it actually helps act like a one-way check valve and helps hold those wires inside the electrical box. I did that as just a reference to show you guys and I was kind of annoyed that I did because it took me a couple minutes to get that wire back out of my spare electrical box that I had. Another minor mistake that I did make is there was an extra two by four in the wall that made it so I could not use a super deep box and I had to go get a medium sized box because it would not go flush to the wall because of that two by four. So just something to watch out for. Now my house did have two by six studs around the outer perimeter of the house. So I was still able to use a pretty deep box even though that two by four was in the wall. Now when I get these boxes, I like to get the ones with these flip out tabs that grab on the drywall. It just adds some extra strength to the holding power of the outlet box. Once removing the wires from the outlet, I did push my electrical cord through that outlet box, push that outlet box into the wall and tighten down the two screws that held those flip out tabs and tightened it down against the drywall. Because I was next to those two other studs, I did add some extra screws and covered those with some electrical tape to add some extra strength to that outlet box as well. So even though I had to disconnect those wires from the outlet to run the cord through the electrical box, it did work out well in the end because the wires were already cut to length 
and already stripped, ready to put on the outlet. Because as I showed you with the electrical box, when you only break the one side of that tab, it does end up acting like a one-way check valve. So you don't want to pull a bunch of slack out of the wall to make it easier to hook up at this point because you have a heck of a time getting that wiring back into the wall. Now, a couple things when you're hooking these wires up, make sure you do have them really snug and tight. Loose connections on an electrical system can cause resistance, which can cause heat and also a voltage drop which can all shorten the life of the equipment that you're running off this outlet. Another thing to watch out for is that you don't have excessive bare wire hanging out past the outlet because that can lead to something shorting it out. Now, because this wire is so thick, it is hard to completely eliminate that bare wire, but as you can see, I've got it as minimal as possible. If possible, it's also a good idea to tug on each one of those wires after you connect them to make sure you don't see any movement at all to ensure a tight connection. So right here, you can see even with that minimal amount of cord I had sticking out of the wall that I'm struggling to get that outlet pushed flush against the electrical box. Another thing that's a little different on a 220 outlet is you wanna have the ground at the top of the outlet, unlike 110 where normally it is at the bottom. I installed the four screws that held that outlet to the outlet box. When tightening down these screws, I like to use my drill because I can set my torque settings so I don't over tighten these screws and strip out the electrical box. Then I put the cover on and put the four screws that held the cover to the outlet. That's about all there is to do on this end. Now it's time to hook those wires up in the electrical panel. Once opening up your electrical panel, it's a good idea at this point to shut your main breaker off. However, I did pull the two screws that held my cover in place so I could show you guys how to make sure that your voltage is off and it's safe to hook these wires up. The main breaker should be at the top of your panel. Right here, I'm using my voltmeter. To show you guys what this panel will read with the breaker in the on position. So right here, you can see between the two main legs, I'm reading 252 volts. There will also be a bus bar for the common, and if you go from that to each one of those legs, you should get 125 volts, give or take a little bit, on each one of those. And you should get those same readings going from the ground bus bar to each one of the 120 volt legs as well. Now I'm going to go ahead and shut that main breaker off, and we're going to test it again to verify that we are safe to work on this panel. Once again, with my multimeter set on AC volts, I'm testing across the two main legs coming out of that breaker, making sure I have zero volts, and from the common or ground to each one of those legs, verifying that as well. And now we know we are safe to work on this panel. I pushed my Romex wire through the opening in the electrical panel. Using a pair of side cutters, I put a slit in the insulation surrounding the wires. Once you do that, if you tug on two of the wires away from each other, it should peel back that insulation without a problem. One thing that's easy to miscalculate is how much wire you actually need inside the panel. I thought I was gonna be plenty good with five foot and I just went with six foot to be on the safe side. However, that six foot barely reached my white wire up to the ground bus bar where it needed to be. So you might want to calculate in an extra two to three feet just for the electrical panel. So right here, I've just got a basic electrical panel drawing and I'm just going to explain how these panels work really quick. So right here is the main breaker that we shut off so we could hook the breaker up and hook the wires up to run that outlet. You have two 120 legs coming off of this main breaker and I've got the one drawn up with this purple color here. And you'll notice it'll go off and it'll go off to this side of the breakers and over to this side. And then I've got another 120 leg coming off the breaker in this orange color that's doing the same thing. It comes off to both sides of the panel. So when you've got a single breaker on here, that's just 120 volts AC coming out of that single breaker. Same thing here. However, if you go to a dual breaker, not only are you pulling off of this leg through this wire right here, you're also pulling a 120 leg off of this side as well, which is what gives you your 240 volts between those two wires. So for whatever reason, if you end up putting a single breaker off of here, and then you hook that up, and then you grab another single breaker and you come off of this leg right here, you're only gonna get 120 volts between those two legs, and that's because you're pulling off the same pole on that main breaker.
So that's why it's so critical to use a dual breaker because then you are pulling one side off of this leg and one side off of this leg, which is what's giving you the 240 volts. So here's a better view of the actual breaker panel itself so I can show you what I was talking about on the whiteboard. So there is your main 240 volt breaker and then this is your one 120 leg down where I'm putting the circuit breaker on. And here's where the other 120 leg comes down from the other side to give me my 240 volts for the outlet. So right here I'm just cutting the red and black wires to length and stripping back a little bit of the insulation so I can hook them up to my 40 amp breaker. I stripped a little too much of the insulation off of the black wire so I cut that back a little bit. Then put those wires in the circuit breaker and tighten them down. Once again, just like hooking up the outlet, you don't want any excessive bare wire hanging out past the breaker and you do want to make sure that you tighten those jam nuts down nice and tight because you do not want a loose connection because that could create heat and a possible fire hazard. As far as the circuit breakers go, there are different styles. So if you're not sure which style you have, it might be a good idea to pull one of the breakers out of the box and take it with you when you go down to get your supplies to make sure you get the right one. I have made this mistake in the past. However, I didn't need to do that this time because I already knew exactly what style of breaker I had to get. No matter what style breaker it is, usually it hooks in on the one side and then you push on the opposite side and it snaps into position. So when I first tried to pop this new breaker in, it wasn't going and I thought I might have had the wrong breaker, which is why I chose to pull out the single pull breaker that was above it to compare the style of breakers and make sure they were the same. After doing that, I realized it was just because it was a dual pull breaker, it took me a little bit more force to pop it into place. I could have cut that bare wire back where the rest of the wires were coming out of the sheathing, but instead I decided just to wrap it up at the bottom of the box in case for whatever reason I need it at a later date. I stripped back my white wire and attached it to the ground bus bar. The ground bus bar on my panel was in the top left corner and was easily identified by all the bare wires going to it. All you have to do is loosen one of those studs, put the wire in and tighten that stud back down. Since this wire is insulated, it's a good idea to label it with some green tape to identify that for somebody else that works on this panel at a later date that that wire is being used for ground. There will also be a bus bar for all the commons in your panel, and that is easily identified by all of the white wires that are insulated on that bus bar. And in my case, that one was on the top right corner of my panel. So because I added that extra breaker, I did have to snap out a couple more slots on the panel cover. I did this by just using a pair of channel locks. Before putting the electrical panel cover back on, I did flip on my main breaker just to make sure I didn't see any arcs on any of the circuit breakers because upon startup is when you're gonna see an arc if something is loose and I could have taken care of it at that point. The panel cover hooks in at the top and then there's two screws that hold it at the bottom. It is critical you get this panel cover put back in properly because it is actually what holds those circuit breakers in place. So I've got my circuit breaker in and in the on position, I turned my main breaker back on. Now I'm just making sure I have the correct voltages at the outlet. So between the two straight poles on the outlet, I have my 250 volts. And then between my ground and each straight pole, I have 125, which is exactly what we're looking for. After I verified that, all I had left to do was tidy up my Romex wire inside the wall and put the cover that I built the last time I ran some electrical for my Christmas lights back on. That just slides into place and then I use a handful of screws to hold it to the surrounding 2x4s and the two pieces of wood that I added to the top and bottom. The other thing I like to do is label each circuit breaker that I add so I know exactly what it does in the house. And I just use a permanent marker and if need be to erase something that was already there you can use some brake clean and a rag. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this video and it gave you some good information. If so make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I'd really appreciate it. The whole concept of my channel is to give you guys the most information in the least amount of time as possible so I don't waste your time. And I hope to see you next time. Have a good one. Later.